بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والحمد لله رب العالمين بارئ الخلائق أجمعين باعث الأنبياء والمرسلين ثم الصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء وسيد المرسلين حبيب إله العالمين المصطفى أبي القاسم محمد وعلى آله الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين المنتجبين الذين أذهب الله عنهم الرجس وطهرهم تطهيرا اللهم صل على محمد صلى الله عليك يا سيدي ويا مولاي يا أبا عبد الله الصادق صلى الله عليك يا ابن رسول الله يا شهيد يا مسموم جعلنا الله من شيعتك ورزقنا الله في الدنيا زيارتك وشفاعتك في الدنيا وفي القبر وفي الآخرة أما بعد فقد قال الله تبارك وتعالى في كتابه المجيد وقرآنه الحميد وقوله الحق أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ولولا دفع الله الناس بعضهم ببعض لفسدت الأرض ولكن الله ذو فضل على العالمين صدق الله العلي العظيم صلوا على محمد وآل محمد اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد This ayah from Surah Al-Baqarah is describing the texture of the society in order for it to progress. A society to progress, it needs to be woven together harmoniously so that it can progress for the benefit and the betterment of the society. Each thread on its own is contributing. I'll give you an example to get the picture clearer. Suppose a group of scientists want to discover an anti-cancer medication or drug. There has to be some collaboration here. One scientist on his own in this day and age would not be able to do something like this. There has to be collaboration. You will have, for example, the biochemist. He will test the drug, the mechanism of its action. You may need a pharmacologist who will test the toxicity of the drug, the efficacy of the drug, maybe tested on some animal models, on some tissue culture, and some cells. You might need a chemist who analyzes the drug, figures out its stru structure and then maybe try to come up with a way to reproduce this drug, to synthesize this drug that is inexpensive and commercially viable. When the drug, for example, goes through these testing phases, then you might need, you will need also the medical community, an oncologist, you will need some medical scientists and scholars who will test this medication onto people. After you've passed the stage, or sometime during these stages, you will also need the marketers, the financial contributors, those who will, for example, promote this drug, commercialize this drug. So right there, you see there is a harmonious texture of scientists, of scholars, of financial individuals who are working together to have this drug reach basically the hand of those who are in need of it. 
So they're working together for the benefit of the community, for the society. Imagine now if one person in this process, one of those individuals who are involved in this process, says, wait a minute, I want my interest to be catered for first and foremost. Before we go any step, anything, I want to make sure that 75% or 60% of the profits are in my pocket. They tell him, wait a minute, you're not alone in this. So how could you have the highest share when you're not the only person working on this? There is a group of us, so at the very least we should divide it equally. He would say, no, my interest first, my benefit first. This would disturb this harmony. This would disturb this structure and what would you have happening either injustice would be served he will take the highest share and that's injustice that's not fair or you would have something breaking apart the structure would break, break apart and maybe what would happen is this individual because his interest is not served he would start basically fighting against this medication and instead of propagating it, promoting it, thinking of the benefit of the cult, of the society, of humanity, he's putting his interest first and foremost. Now, that example, maybe one of the interpretations of the ayah, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, kana nasu ummata wahida. Humanity, humans, were one nation. People were one nation, one group, one group. Initially, those people, these scientists, these marketeers, those financial advisors, all were one group. Until what happened? Interest started coming in, people's interests. So then, when interest started coming in, there is a transgression on the paths of people's rights. There's a transgression now. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, people were one nation, but to solve this transgression, to solve these problems, فَبَعَثَ اللَّهُ النَّبِيِّينَ مُبَشِّرِينَ وَمُنْذِرِينَ Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had to send the prophets or the messengers, the prophets, مُبَشِّرِينَ, giving glad tidings, مُنذِرِينَ, warnings, giving incentives, scaring people, telling them about the consequences of their actions, so here we see this kind of message that the messengers came with. Now the messengers came to educate the people, to teach the people, to create this harmony into the society. But people with interests, people who felt that, no, this is not good for my business started resisting their messages, started facing them. Fir'aun, Musa came to him, said, believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Fir'aun felt threatened by the message of Musa alayhi salam. He felt this message is going to take the authority away from him. He is claiming himself to be a god. People are bowing down to him, prostrating to him, worshipping him. Now Musa is telling him, you prostrate down to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You bow down. This is not good. He felt threatened. He felt his authority is going to be threatened. So one way to control people is to keep them uneducated, to keep them in the darkness. He brought people over. He says, this man who claims himself to be a prophet of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, sent by God, If he has some bracelets of gold, you know, maybe we can talk. Maybe we can believe him. Look at him, poor guy. Look at him. He's carrying a stick in his hand, and that's it. Or what else? If he claims to be a prophet of Allah, if the angels come with him, let the angels come. He claims he comes from Allah. Allah sent him. Why not angels support him? So people who are either uneducated or people who have interest with him, people whom he pays off, he pays them. So they're, they're, 
their interest is associated with his interest as well. Quran says, فَاسْتَخَفَّ قَوْمَهُ فَأَطَاعُوهُ He fooled his people, so he, they followed him. They obeyed him. They followed him. They were corrupt people according to the Holy Quran. Those are corrupt people. So those people feel threatened by this message. When this harmony comes, when this education comes, they are threatened by this. Our Holy Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alihi comes. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. He comes to educate. The Prophet, one of his messages or one of his tasks is to educate people, to teach them about the kitab, to teach them, educate them, enlighten them. This didn't go too well with some people. Some people wanted to be the higher up, wanted to have the authority. This man is teaching people about equality. What is equality? What is this nonsense? Some of the people felt that their interests are threatening, being threatened here. Abu Jahal comes to the Prophet ﷺ. He says, you claim that my slave Bilal and I are equal? He says, your slave is a Muslim. You are not. So he is better than you. This doesn't go too well with him. Where is this? Where are the elites? Now their structure is being threatened. You had individuals like Abu Jahal, Abu Lahab, Abu Sufyan, Al-As ibn Wa'il, Al-Walid. Those people who had an institution, some of them based on interest. Interest, riba, riba. They were making money well from it. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi comes and says, riba is haram. You can't have riba, you can't have these interests. Obviously, these individuals would not be happy with such a claim. They have businesses, institutions based built on these. Like we see today, by the way. Today we see many of these individuals and institutions raising and waging such a war against Islam. Just like the war that was waged 1400 years ago. Because Islam is threatening their interests. Well, just like we had riba back then, today we have institutions, countries built on this institution of interests, riba. Obviously to them, Islam is a problem. Islam comes and says there is no riba. This is a problem. So you need to fight against it. Islam comes and says you have to control your desire. Don't be driven by greed. This doesn't go too well with people. So you have them fighting to the best of their abilities to destroy Islam. One of the means is the movie, the recent movie that is now propagating all over the internet about our Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wa Alaihi showing him in such derogatory means, in such derogatory ways, which now caused all this basically demonstrations that we see worldwide now of course as followers of Ahlul Bayt alayhim salam we do not condone violence however such in such instances such movies should be considered and classified as hate speech should be outlawed people who were responsible for this need to be held responsible for it Few months ago, one of the weekend Islamic schools, it was discovered in their syllabus that some of the vocabulary in this school that is taught in some of the syllabus may be harmful, attacking towards a particular group of people. So what happened? The school was contacted by the institution representing those individuals and was informed. The school apologized. They said, no problem. They took it out from the website. They took it out from the curriculum. Was this enough? No. A complaint was filed that this is hate crime. This school is teaching hate. Hate crime. Now, 
history, what happened in history cannot be changed. But we are being told, do not mention what happened in history because it offends some people. And this we will say, no, we're sorry. History is history. We will talk about what happened in history. Yes, some of the vocabulary may need to be changed as our Ahlul Bayt have taught us many, many times that watch what you say and how you say it. Don't demonize people, don't attack. But as Amir al Mu'mineen said to his companions, he said to them, describe what those people do, describe their actions when he was asked about Muawiyah. He said, don't use foul language against Muawiyah. This is not our akhlaq, our ethics. They said, so how should we describe? He said, describe his actions. Say what he does. Talk about what he does. Now, when that was done, an a complaint was made that those individuals, this school is propagating hate, hate speech. They're teaching hate speech. And the whole investigation was launched about few words in the syllabus that may propagate, according to those individuals, hate speech. Now here you have a whole movie propagating hatred, fueling all this bias, and no one is saying a word, but rather it is free speech. Free speech. When the Norwegian bombings took place, for which the person who did them just got sentenced, few weeks ago this person who did the bombings he wrote a manifesto so-called manifesto he wrote a document in it he quoted several writers scholars so-called intellectuals who attack Islam attack Muslims the threat of Islam he quotes them I still remember the CBC did an interview over the phone with one of those individuals who were quoted by this man. And they told her, your writings promoted this. She said, no. I am just saying what I think, my opinion about Muslims. I never said go attack, go kill people. Never said that. Yes, but your writing is fueling, instigating hate instigating people when they read your writing when they see these fallacies they instigate this hate they fuel people they charge people one needs to be held accountable for this free speech free speech but hate speech is different free speech has a limit today even in this country in this country or in the democratic countries i still remember a few months ago there was a trial in one of the most developed countries in the world today. Why? Because a man was in an airport. This man in the airport is not a Muslim. He's from that own country, one of like so-called natives, original people from that country. In the airport, there was a delay in the plane. A delay, delay, hours. They were kept into the plane, into the airport. What happened? This man sent a text to a friend of his or some, someone a relative, in the text message he wrote, I am so angry, I feel like blowing up this airport. This is, he was held accountable for saying this and put on trial. What do you mean you're going to blow up the airport? Alhamdulillah, he was not a Muslim. Otherwise, you know, Alhamdulillah. He said, I was angry, I was frustrated, I was just, they said, no. Free speech has a limit. You say you're going to blow up the airport. This is not free speech. He was put on trial. One of the most developed countries in the world today. Today you go into the airport and shout a bomb. You know, don't do this. But someone goes there and shout. Will they be allowed? He says free speech. I'm Allah. Free speech. Has a limit. Free speech as long as you don't transgress on the boundaries of others. And that is what's written in the Canadian Charter of Rights. Those of you can access it online. Go ahead. See, free speech within a limit. As long as you don't transgress, as long as you don't cause chaos, you don't cause problems, go ahead, no problem. Free speech. People used to criticize Amir al-Mu'mineen, the Khawarij, when he was the Khalifa. 
individual criticism we disagree with you they call him names he told the people listen you have a problem with me personally okay you know this is your personal matter no problem this is your personal opinion i will not impose anything upon you however don't go and transgress on other people's rights don't go and interfere with other people's rights and so he let them he let them one man came to him he said to him i will not pray behind you he said don't pray behind me i will not pay allegiance to you don't pay allegiance to me and he said as long as you do not harm any of the muslims i guarantee you your safety and baytul mal the muslim treasury will give you money as well you don't have to give me you know, allegiance we will still pay you this is the akhlaq of islam but when they started killing people, transgressing on the paths, on the rights of people, then Amir al-Mu'mineen had to intervene. The state had to intervene, had to discipline these individuals. So here you have this fight, aggressive fight against Islam since that day until today. People try to create these fallacies against Islam, fight Islam to the best of their ability. Because to them, Islam is like this light. You know, the electrical light or the LED light. They, if they have any light, would be like a candle light. Today, who, use, who uses lanterns and candle lights and oil lamps? They're extinct, obsolete. Everybody's using these lights now, nowadays. So when you have such a light, you turn it off, so then the lantern or that lamp, the oil lamp becomes the brightest light in the room. That is what is happening against Islam since that day until today. And the unfortunate part, our institutions are keeping silent, quiet. That is the sad part. Our prophet is being attacked. Now we're not saying go be violent. This is not something we condone. The attacks that happened, innocents were killed. We do not condone these things. We do not propagate these things. But we say, write in local papers, educate, talk to your members of parliaments, MLAs, express your concerns. These are your rights as citizens to speak against hate speech. That website which has this video has not yet taken it down. Why not? This is something that goes against the Muslims, billions of people, 1.7 billion people here. We need to act. Those people at the time of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, Islam came as a threat to them. So they fought against it. Abu Jahl, Abu Sufyan, they fought in the battle of Badr. They came. Abu Jahl was killed by Abdullah ibn Mas'ud. Abu Sufyan's son, Hanzala. The brother of Muawiyah ibn Abi Sufyan was killed by Amir al-Mu'mineen sallallahu alayhi The father of Hind, the mother of Muawiyah, the grandfather of Muawiyah was killed by Amir al-Mu'mineen sallallahu alayhi Of course, this animosity then remained. This hatred remained. And we see it continuing until the time Amir al-Mu'mineen sallallahu alayhi became the Khalifa. And this animosity continued to brew. People are fighting the justice. People fight the fairness. People do not want others to educate them, to teach them because it will intervene and threaten their interests. Muawiyah wants the Khilafah. He wants the leadership. Ali ibn Abi Talib is just and fair. He will not go with what he likes, with his plans. So he fights against Amir al-Mu'mineen, sallallahu alayhi and the fight is aggressive. And then until Amir al-Mu'mineen sallallahu alayhi gets killed, Imam al-Hasan comes alayhi salam and the fight continues and gets even more aggressive. Until Imam al-Hasan is forced to hand the reins of Khilafah to Muawiyah ibn Abi Sufyan. And he institutes the curse of Ali ibn Abi Talib sallallahu alayhi on the members, on the pulpits. Using the foul language against Amir al-Mu'mineen sallallahu alayhi in the Salat, Salat al-Jum'ah, in the Khutbah, the Sermon of Khutbah al-Jum'ah, every time. And the interesting thing is that people today say the Shia, the followers of Ahlul Bayt, are the ones who curse the Sahaba. 
You ask them who, who started this tradition? Who made it a tradition? Muawiyah ibn Abi Sufyan made it a tradition. When someone hears that his imam is being cursed on the pulpit, obviously you'll have some individuals, some individuals will get upset. Some people will get angry. They might reply back. That's why Quran tells us do not use such a language. This is not the language of Muslims. Even the Quran says do not use such a language against the gods of other people because they will use reverse this language on Allah wal-Iyadu Billah. So be polite, be respectful. But even then, you find our ulama, our scholars, and by scholars I mean fuqaha, by our maraja' mujtahideen, look at their language until this day and age, from that day until today. The language of our imams, alayhim salam, the tone of them and their companions, respectful. Muawiyah goes, and he designates his son Yazid ibn Muawiyah as the Khalifa. In the first year, he kills Imam Hussein sallallahu alayhi. In the second year, he attacks Medina, where 700 of the most faithful companions of Rasulullah, those who used to teach Quran, were killed. More than 1,000 women were impregnated in the haram, attacked. The third year, he burns the Kaaba, and that's what they want. They want to destroy anything, any structure that resembles Islam, anything. Destroy Medina, destroy Kaaba, and then Allah takes him to Jahannam wa bi'sal masir. Then he assigns his son, Muawiyah the second, who gives a khutbah, one khutbah where he says that our grandfather, my grandfather Muawiyah took the khilafah away from the rightful people, Ali ibn Abi Talib and al-Hasan alayhim salam If dunya was of any good, of good, then we, the children of Abu Sufyan, had enough of this good. And if it's bad, we've had enough of this bad either. So here I am resigning from it. And he left. It is said he lived only for 40 days and some say he was poisoned. Then the Khilafah turned away from Bani Sufyan to Bani Marwan. Marwan ibn al-Hakam took the Khilafah. After which Abdul Malik ibn Marwan came with an iron grip. Al-Hajjaj ibn Yusuf al-Taqabi on his side killing Abdullah ibn al-Zubair, killing Mus'ab, his brother, killing all those enemies of theirs, and the Khilafah came back in control of the hands of Bani Umayyah. In this era, during the last three years of the Khilafah of Abdul Malik ibn Marwan, our Imam al-Sadiq sallallahu wa sallamuhu alayhi is born. He's born in these tensions, witnessing what's going on here. Looking at the environment and how electrified it is. The animosity against Ahlul Bayt alayhim salam Why? Because they propagate the word of haqq, truth. And those people want their own interests. They don't like these words of truth. So they fight against it. Al-Walid ibn Abdul Malik ibn Marwan comes and kills Imam al-Sajjad salawatullahi wa salamuhu alayh. After Imam al-Sadiq spends with his grandfather, 15 years approximately. So Imam al-Sadiq grows on the lap of his grandfather, Imam al-Sajjad alayhi salam, seeing him propagating this religion through dua, through educating people. This has, of course, a huge impact on this child. This environment has a big impact on him. Then he spends the next 19 years with his father, Imam al-Baqir salawatullahi wa salamuhu alayhi until he gets poisoned by Husham ibn Abdul Malik ibn Marwan. He saw Imam al-Baqir alayhi salam, his father, starting the school, educating, teaching. So all this, of course, had an impact and an effect on Imam al-Sadiq alayhi. He saw how his father deals with people, the strategy of his father in dealing with the companions, in educating the companions, so that they can fight against this ignorance. And hence, when he took, takes the reins of the Imamah at the age of approximately 34 years, this youthful age, he takes it, and that was the time when there is a lot of chaos. 
among the leaders of Bani Umayyah. If you take a look at the last few years of the leadership of Bani Umayyah, every year a new Khalifa comes because there's just so much stress, so much fighting, so much war taking place until they lost it. During this time, Imam al-Sadiq witnessed the animosity, the hatred towards the companions of Ahlul Bayt Until Bani al-Abbas of course came and took it. Initially, Bani al-Abbas gave their allegiance to the children of Imam al-Hasan a man by the name of Muhammad ibn Abdullah ibn al-Hasan al-Muthallath, the third, the grandson of Imam al-Hasan. So the grandson of the grandson of Imam al-Hasan, they paid him his allegiance, their allegiance. Al-Safah, Al-Mansur, all of them paid their allegiance to this man to become the Khalifa. And they invited Imam al-Sadiq in the circle as well. They told him, you pay your allegiance also to him. He said, he will not get it. They said, what do you mean? He said, this man will get it first, referring to Al-Safah. Then it is him, Al-Mansur. And Imam al-Sadiq leaves. And this caused some tension between the children of Imam al-Hasan and between Imam al-Sadiq for some time. But indeed, as Imam al-Salam projected, he realized in his foresight, in his knowledge, that this revolution is not a sincere, genuine revolution. So that's why when he was called and invited to lead it, he said, the time is not my time. And those companions are not my companions. Those people you claim are my supporters, my helpers, they're not really my helpers. They're after their own interests. And when you have people fighting with interest, you can't win a war. You can't win a war. Because they will not obey you. Like what happened to Amir al-Mu'mineen, sallallahu alayhi in the Battle of Safin. You had some people fighting for interest, their own interest. And that's why the split happened. If everyone was a genuine follower of the Imam, the split would not have happened. If everyone obeyed the word of the Imam, sallallahu alayhi the split would not have happened. Imam al-Sadiq understands this, knows, so he rejected that. And indeed, the tables turned and the Safah comes to power. He starts killing for four years until his brother Al-Mansur comes to power. And he starts killing even more and more, especially the Bani Hashim, subhanAllah. The animosity they had towards Bani Hashim was amazing. It's like they felt this guilt, you know, they had this guilt in their heart that they paid their allegiance to this man. But they took the Khilafah. So they kind of, you know, so what they did, they went back and attacked the children of Bani Hashim, especially the children of Imam al Hassan, السلام, one after the other, killing them one after the other. Amazing tactics. One day, Al Mansur tells a man by the name of Ibn Muhajir, he says, Listen, take this money, go to Medina, meet with Abdullah ibn al Hassan. A man by the name of Abdullah, one of the grandsons, or the great grandson of Imam al-Hasan And with Ja'far ibn Muhammad, Imam al-Sadiq sallallahu alayhi He says, meet them, tell them, I am one of your companions and supporters from Khurasan. I have this money that I want to give to you, Amanat. Here, take this money. When you give it to them, tell them, because this is people's money, this is not my money, can you please give me the receipt with your own handwriting saying that you have taken this money from me? He says, okay, Ibn Muhajir goes to Medina. After some time, he comes back. Mansur tells him, so what happened? He said, I got you all the signatures you wanted except for one. He said, which one? He said, Ja'far ibn Muhammad. He said, how come? He said, I did as you told me. One day I thought I will go to Ja'far ibn Muhammad. So I went where? I went to Masjid al-Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. I saw him praying there. I waited until he finished the salat. After the salat, I approached him. I told him as you told me. Before I say a word, I wanted to tell him as you told me. Before I say a word, he told me, listen, do not try to play a game with the children of Bani Muhammad, Ali Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa ali. Do not fool them. And tell your master not to fool the children of Ali Muhammad, of, Bani, of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa ali, the Prophet's children. Don't play this trick. Don't play this game. And tell him not to play this game either. He said, I, I told him, what do you mean? What are you talking about? He said, he told me everything that took 
place between you and I, the conversation, as if he was the third person with us in the room. Al-Mansur al-Abbasi told him, he says, every era, every time there is someone whom Allah sends revelation to, and this Ja'far ibn Muhammad is the muhaddith of this time. He is the one whom Allah communicates with him. And in few lectures ago, many lectures ago, I described what is the meaning of revelation here. We're not talking about revelation like the Prophet ﷺ, so don't get confused here. But Al-Mansur, interestingly, he tells this man, Ibn Muhajir, the muhaddith of this time, the one whom Allah communicates with, the one whom Allah chooses is this man, Ja'far ibn Muhammad. So these tactics he used to see. And then what Mansur wanted is to take these signatures and use them to punish those people. To tell them, look, you're plotting against me. You're collecting money. By what means you're collecting money? I'm the Khalifa. Zakat should come to me. All the money should come. Why are you collecting money? Why are you people paying, paying to you? And he would go and kill. Like he killed many of Bani Hashim. Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salam to fight this ignorance. To fight also the misconception and the ideologies that people were adopting from the Greek philosophies, from all those Western philosophies that people were reading about and they're getting brainwashed by them, from the philosophies of the Khawarij, the Kharijites. Their ideologies was trying to now infiltrate. He started educating his companions following the suit of his Father Imam al Baqir teaching his companions how to respond, how to communicate, and telling them go and engage in discourse, in conversations. One day, a Shami, a man from Sham, comes. He says, You are Ja'far ibn Muhammad? He says, Yes, I am. He says, I heard you're a alim, you're a scholar. He said, What do you need? What do you want? He said, I came here to have a conversation with you, a discussion with you. He said, About what? He said, I want to discuss with you about Quran. He says, wait a minute. He turns to one of his companions by the name of Himran ibn Ayun. He says, yeah, Himran, come and discuss with this Shami, with this man from Sham. The man says, I want to discuss with you, not with your student. He says, discuss with him. If you can defeat him, it's as if you defeated me, myself. He discusses with Himran until Himran basically exhausts him, you know, shreds him into pieces. Then he says, well, hold on. I want to discuss with you, Ya Ja'far ibn Muhammad. Now about what? He said, about the Arabic language. al al Arabiya. He said, no problem. Ya Abban ibn Taghlub. Abban, come. Discuss with him. He discusses with Abban. Abban wins the discussion. He says, I want to discuss with you. Now about what? About fiqh. The laws of jurisprudence. No problem. Ya Zurar ibn Ayun. Come. Discuss with him. Zurara discusses with him and wins the argument and the discussion. He says, I want to discuss with you. Now about what? He says, about ilmul kalam, the science of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the belief in monotheism, tawheed, the aqaid. He says, no problem. Ya mu'min al taq one of the companions. Come discuss with him. Mu'min al taq wins the argument. And Nu'man, he wins the argument. I want to discuss with you. Now about what? About Imama. No problem. Ya Husham ibn al-Hakam. Discuss with him. I want to discuss with you. Now about what? About Tawheed. Ya Husham ibn Salim. Come discuss with him. After discussing with all those companions and losing the arguments, the Shami tells Imam al-Sadiq, it is as if you want to tell me that such people are your companions. He said, indeed. Those are my companions. Look at what we've raised. He raised them. Not just educated them, raised them. There is a difference. When you educate, you teach, or you educate with akhlaq and manners, you raise people. In Arabic called tarbiya, tarbiya, murabbi. He educates them, teaches them. He tells Abban ibn Taghlub, Ya Abban, sit in the masjid of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi and give fatwa to people. Like what mujtahids do today. Sit down. Because I want people, I like it, to see people like you among my Shia. Like you, among my Shia. 
How many of us are like Abban ibn Taghlub? No. He educates them. He teaches them. He tells them, go. And they used to defend the religion. They used to do very well. One day, Husham ibn al-Hakam, this man, came to the Imam, alayhi salam, sat down next to him. He said, Ya Husham, Imam al-Sadiq asked him, alayhi salam, tell me, what did you do to Amr ibn Ubaid? Amr ibn Ubaid was an Imam from the other madhahib. He used to teach in Masjid al-Basra. He used to teach me. Tell me, what did you do to him? He said, Yabna Rasulullah, I feel embarrassed to talk in, in your presence. He says, no, if we order you, you have to speak. He said, I went to him. I saw people are gathering around him. And he does not follow you. So I felt bad. I went to him. He said, anyone with a question? I said, yes, I have a question. What is your question? Ya Amr ibn Ubaid. Ya Aba Marwan. Do you have eyes? He said, yes. What do you do with them? He said, I see with them. Do you have ears? Yes. What do you do with them? I listen with them. Do you have a tongue? Yes. What do you do with it? I taste with it. Do you have a nose? Yes. What do you do with it? I smell with it. He said, do you have a brain? He said, yes. He said, what do you do with the brain? He said, the brain takes this information that my senses have. My senses receive the information. Pass it to the brain. The brain processes it and tells me, what am I seeing? What am I hearing? What am I smelling? He says, why do you need the brain when your eyes are functional and your ears are functional and your nose is functional? Why do you need the brain? He says, the brain is necessary to distinguish what is right and what is wrong. He said, Yabna Ibn Ubaid, you claim that your body, Allah created it and did not leave it without an imam, a guide that would guide it to the truth. And he left your religion without an imam? The religion is made without an imam who will guide you? He said, are you Husham ibn al-Hakam? Husham, maybe because of taqiyya or fear, whatever reason. He said, no, I am not. He said, are you one of his students? He said, no. He said, where do you come from? He said, I come from Kufa. He said, you are Husham ibn al-Hakam. Come over here. And he told his students, as long as he is here in the class, I will not speak a word. Imam al-Sadiq told Husham ibn al-Hakam, this is interesting. He said, how did you come up with this argument? He said, Yabna Rasulillah. It's as if I was inspired. I was guided to speak like this. Allah gives me. وَالَّذِينَ جَاهَدُوا فِينَا Allah says, لَنَهْدِيَنَّهُمْ سُبُولَنَا Those who struggle to find our path, we will guide them to our path. We'll guide them to our path. He says, what you spoke of is in the Suhuf, the Suhuf of Ibrahim and Musa. This is found there. The ayah that we recited in the beginning says, if Allah were not to use some individuals like these, like those people, like our Imams السلام, and the followers of the Imam, then the earth would have gone into corruption. Those people would just serve their interest. And in serving their interests, they would corrupt the earth itself, like we see in the pollution that is happening today, the destruction that is happening today. But Allah says, Allah has fadl, blessing, grace on people. What is this grace? It is Ahlul Bayt alayhim salam who raised such companions, disciplined such companions, gave the akhlaq and the power to such companions, who in turn did not keep silent, went out, had conversations, had discussions, and that's what we need to do, brothers and sisters. That's what we learn from Imam Salamullahi Alayhi. But when the Imam Salamullahi Alayhi, his students grew in number, his popularity used to increase day after day. Al Mansur al Abbasi could not bear this anymore. One day, a man comes to see him by the name of Muhammad al Iskandarani. He finds him. In deep thought, he says, what is the problem? Ya Aba Ja'far, Ya Amir al Mu'mineen. He says, we've killed 100 from Bani Hashim so far. Yet their master is still alive. He said, who do you mean? He says, Ja'far ibn Muhammad. He says, I have to kill him. He says, leave him. He's grown old now. He's now old. 
And he's busy, was busy with his ibadah and his salat. He said, no, we have to finish him. So he sends to his governor in Medina to give the poison to Imam al-Sadiq salawatullahi wa salamuhu alayhi. And the Imam gets poisoned. Then on the 25th day of Shawwal, the Imam salamullahi alayhi is lying on his deathbed in pain, in difficulty. His family gathers around him. They look at him. They see him in this state. They feel the pain, the difficulty. After spending his life defending the religion of Islam, the message of his grandfather, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, now he is being poisoned. And this great imam, this great light of guidance is going to leave dunya. So his family is gathered around him. He used to go into sleep, then wake up, then into sleep, and then wake up. Then he told, bring my family around me, gather them all. They gathered the whole family around him. He told them, tell our Shia that our Shafa'a would not reach someone who takes his Salat lightly. Then he stretched his arms and his legs and he started saying Bismillah wa billah wa ala millati jaddi rasulillah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi Ashhadu an la ilaha illa Allah wa anna jaddi muhammadan rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi then he stretched his arms and legs and his soul departed his body the family around him started crying aywa abata aywa ja'fara aywa sayyida Aywa mazluma, aywa shahida. Then Imam al Kazim alayhi salam took care of his father. He prepared the body of his father for burial. Then he took his father and buried him next to his grandfather, Imam al Baqir alayhi salam in Baqi'ah. I say, Ya Mawla, Ya Imam al Kazim, when your father left this dunya, Bani Hashim were all standing around him, all taking care of him. When he left this dunya, you took care of his ghusul, his kafan, and his burial. But that, but your grandfather, Abi Abdullah al Hussein, was lying on the plains of Karbala for three days without ghusl or kafan. And he had no family around him, no one to take care of him. <laughs> At one point, uh, the children are running around, no support, no help. Um, one of the daughters of Abi Abdullah al Hussein goes missing. Um, Zainab salam goes searching for her. She finds her hugging the body of her father, uh, crying, O oh, Father, who killed you? Who beheaded you? O oh, Father, why is your head on the spears of Bani Umayyah? Zainab salam tells her little girl, What are you doing here? She said, Amma Zainab, when I saw the enemies of Allah attacking us, I said, I will turn to my father to help me, to protect me. But I saw my father, a body without a hand, and his head is on the spears of Bani Umayyah. Zainab salam looked at the body of Abi Abdullah. Baradar to Budid bin Machun Amiri 
چرا من بپوشم لباس اسیر یا با عبدالله get up and look at your sister Zainab آه إنا لله وإنا إليه راجعون وسيعلم الذين ظلموا أي منقلب ينقلبون والعاقبة للمتقين مؤمنين المؤمنات on this day the وفات of the إمام of our مذهب we are called the جعفريز in reference to this great Imam of ours this great Imam who we are sitting here in light remembering him shedding our tears for him yet his grave is in darkness and nobody is allowed to sit on his grave to shed their tears and remember him this Imam whom we turn to with our hearts on this night as we remember him, as we have just shed our tears for him. And we make a request and the dua. And the biggest haja that we need, we have, and the biggest need is his shafa'a. Him to consider us as among sh or his Shia, insha'Allah, until the day of judgment. Raise your hands now, mu'mineen and mu'minat. This is the time of dua. And remember Baqi. Remember the grave of your master, the grave of your imam, alayhi salam. Raise your hands. We have many mu'mineen who are requested our dua, who are in need of dua, who are in the state of desperation. Let us all pray tonight. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, through the blessings of this great gate of hajat, accept our hajat, insha'Allah. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم أما يجيب المضطر إذا دعا ويكشف السوء 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 أما يجيب المضطر إذا دعا ويكشف اللهم إنا نسألك وندعوك باسمك العظيم الأعظم الأعز الأجل الأكرم يا الله 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 إلهي بفاطمة وأبيها وبعلها وبنيها والسر المستودع فيها اكشف عنا السوء يا الله اللهم اغفر ذنوبنا يا الله اللهم كفر عنا سيئاتنا وتوفنا مع الأبرار يا الله إلهي بجعفر بن محمد اجعلنا وذريتنا إلى يوم الدين من شيعة جعفر بن محمد الصادق يا الله إلهي بإمامنا الصادق عليه السلام أرزقنا شفاعته في الدنيا وفي القبر وفي الآخرة يا الله إلهي بالإمام الصادق عليه السلام اقض حوائج المؤمنين والمؤمنات في مشارق الأرض ومغاربها يا الله إلهي بالإمام الصادق فرج عن شيعة الإمام الصادق يا الله إلهي بالإمام الصادق أنصر الإسلام والمسلمين واخذ الأعداء الدين اللهم بالإمام الصادق شافي وعافي جميع مرضى المؤمنين والمؤمنات يا الله إلهي بالإمام الصادق أرزقنا حج بيتك الحرام في عامنا هذا وفي كل عام وارزقنا زيارة قبر نبيك والأئمة عليهم السلام 
إلهي بالإمام الصادق عجل لوليك الفرج واجعلنا من شيعته وأنصاره وأعوانه والمستشهدين بين يديه اللهم كن لوليك الحجة ابن الحسن صلواتك عليه وعلى أبائه في هذه وفي كل وليا وحق وقائدا هو دليلا وعين حتى تسكنه أرضك طوى وتمتعه فيها طويلا برحمتك يا أرحم الله اللهم أرنا الطلعة الرشيدة والغرة الحميدة واكحل أنظارنا بنظر نظرة منا إليه اللهم وعمر وشيد قبور أئمتنا في البقيع يا الله يا الله اللهم ونقسم عليك بالزهراء فاطمة إلا ما رزقتنا شفاعة الزهراء يا الله يا الله يا الله لقضاء الحوائج ولشفاء المرضى ولكشف هذه الغمة عن هذه الأمة ولتعجيل فرج مولانا صاحب العصر والزمان وإلى أرواح المؤمنين والمؤمنات على الخصوص إلى أرواح أموات الجالسين والحاضرين especially for the روح المرحوم أكبر مولو رحم الله من يقرأ السورة المباركة الفاتحة مع الصلوات